Jenkins from Hope Springs Church and I'm here with episode 11 of the Living Visible series entitled Living Visible Towards Authority Figures. So the first question when we're thinking about authority figures for me is who are they? Uh, here's a short list to get our minds going. Parents, uh, can you please stop saying that on fire darling? Children. Dad, get me a biscuit. Bosses, managers. Um, would it be possible to do all of my work for me today? Um, I've got an important golf um, meeting. Teachers. Hi kids. So today I'm going to show you that maths is really seriously cool. Church leaders do not have politicians. What we need you to do is stay inside out for as long, a short a time as probable, okay? Police. Uh, can you speed up that walking, please, sir? You're only allowed outside for exercise. Military. Uh, I can't think of anything in the military. Celebrities. So we should, like, all wear sunglasses inside because, like, the government's 5G experiment is locked out there. Experts. I should just like to say that there is no 5G conspiracy. Please, can people stop listening to... All of these can have some level of perceived authority in our lives. Sometimes it's relational and the authority isn't really enforceable, but it's an agreed social construct. Sometimes it's legal and enforceable under pretty extreme penalties. It might also be that authority is something that we have given voluntarily, for example, with experts in a particular subject matter. Um, so I might see David Bentley Hart as an authority on theology, whereas others are completely free to have an incorrect opinion of him. I think it's relatively easy to relate to that kind of authority because in reality, we still have all of the control. If David Bentley Hart starts putting out articles that I disagree with, I can just stop listening and ta-da, his authority in my life disappears. Nine times out of 10 though, Authority isn't voluntary. Um, we have limited power to choose our politicians, our police. Uh, we don't really choose our teachers or bosses. We don't choose who gets to be a celebrity and have that kind of influential authority. Sure, we can ignore them, um, but they will still go on affecting our lives by influencing the context that we live in, regardless of whether or not we've given them some authority. So Jesus said in Matthew 20, 25, um, the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. A lot of the time, rulers, leaders, authority figures that we encounter don't seem to measure up well to that standard. Um, most of them kind of fall into the flaunt category the lord it over them type of leader. We've all probably had bosses or teachers or leaders like that that we've experienced. And I'm sure we could all pick out politicians who we feel behave that way a lot of the time. But it's important to recognize that if we're looking to take advice from Jesus here, it's not advice on how to judge those rulers. It's quite the opposite. The first statement recognizes that we will all be subject to rulers who do a rubbish job of it. That's just inevitable. We will suffer under authority figures who exploit their power at some point. It's a given, so no judgment. Jesus doesn't say that specifically, but the silence still speaks. I think it reminds us that our task isn't to pass judgment on them. That's not what we're called to do. We will, of course. We'll have all sorts of opinions on how those at the top do things, and that's why we don't need any more encouragement. In reality, no leader is ever going to get it right all the time. Uh, perhaps not even most of the time. In fact, given a large enough scope of responsibility, all leaders will be constantly failing at least some of their flock, their responsibility. It's statistically inevitable. And at some point, we will be on the receiving end of that failure. But our challenge isn't to judge those failures. So what is our challenge? Our challenge is, in the areas that we have authority, to lead as servants, to do the thing that Jesus asked us to do. Our task is to demonstrate 
the right way, the love way. Whenever we have the opportunity to lead, we should look to do so from the bottom up, supporting and serving rather than from the top down. The challenge in Jesus' words is to exercise authority where we find we have it differently. Okay, but the question I'm trying to answer is how do we relate to authority figures, not how do we become good authority figures? How do we relate to them in a way that reveals Jesus? We've identified that, first of all, we don't spend our energy judging them. But what else? So in his first letter to Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul said this, Pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. Jesus also said in Matthew 5, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Persecutors, naturally, would be those who have some kind of authority, otherwise they wouldn't be able to persecute us. So we're supposed to love them, pray for them, and give thanks for them. In a similar way to what Steve was saying last week, doing this doesn't mean you endorse what those leaders are doing. It doesn't mean that you agree, but it changes your posture from one of control or judgment to one of release, to one of support. You may have heard the saying, it's lonely at the top. I think it's true. I haven't had vast experience of being at the top, but I've led enough to know that it can be a scary experience to have all the responsibility for something, for every eye to be looking to you for the next decision, the way forward, or perhaps the next mistake. So we ought to be mindful of that. It's not easy. It might come with some privileges, and sometimes that might tempt jealousy, but don't underestimate the stress that person may be shouldering. So we try not to judge. We empathise, we love, we pray, we support. It won't be easy, but there's a good reason for it, which I will come to. First though, another question came to my mind. Should we obey? We should love, we should pray, we should support, we should give thanks, but obey? In Romans 13 is quite a famous passage. It seems to tell us that we should. I think it's complicated. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Fantastic. We can judge and disobey everything that we think is unjust. Sort of. If you look at the life of Martin Luther King Jr., you realise quite quickly where he went with this moral obligation. He didn't become an outlaw. In some ways, that might have been easy. He worked exceptionally hard at finding ways to resist injustice without breaking laws. For example, the bus boycott in Montgomery. He organised an entire city to stop using the bus service, but no laws were broken. He found a way to resist an unjust system, one where black people had to sit or stand segregated at the back of a bus, but without breaking the law. He took a whole lot of responsibility and risk. A lot of people put their trust in him, and it could have gone massively wrong. He was no armchair judge, criticising the system. He saw a problem, but he respected the perpetrators of that problem enough to see them as misguided rather than evil. So yes, Martin Luther King stood up for justice in the face of corrupted authority, but he recognised that the system was at fault, not the people wrapped up in it, even those quite clearly on the wrong side. He took on his responsibility to resist injustice. He didn't simply fight one injustice with another, he demonstrated a better way. His attitude is summed up well in another quote. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust, and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice, is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. I think this is partly how Martin Luther King's actions are reconciled with Paul's encouragement to obey rulers in Romans 13. Even in challenging authority, the sacrificial way, the servant way, is what we are called to. Now, I said partly because I think there's a bigger perspective here too, and it's to do with relationship. Jesus' teachings are heavily focused on love and relationship. In his prayer in John 17, his central request is that we would be one in unity together. When we think about authority, more often than not, 
the authority figures we might have a problem with are not in any kind of close relationship with us. They're far off operating in different spheres. In some ways, it's what makes it so easy to be judgmental because we don't know them, they become objects to us. I've heard it said that Paul's encouragement to obey in Romans is now out of context because at the time they were expecting the return of Christ imminently. And his encouragement was essentially saying then, don't concern yourself with that stuff, don't waste your time, just stay in line and keep focused on the work we're doing. Now that may well be true, and I'd add to it that the shift in focus takes us away from throwing mud at a far off target towards offering our care and kindness to those around us. So don't focus on that, focus on this that's right here, right now. So again, we aren't obeying because we condone it. We aren't obeying those rules because we agree with what's going on. We might not think it's the right system at all, but our focus is here on our doorstep where we can make a difference. Coincidentally then, when we shift our focus in this way, we might find some people who are oppressed. We might encounter some neighbours, some loved ones, who are being treated unjustly. And our love and care for those neighbours might lead us to want to do something about it. And that's where civil disobedience starts. It's not about critically judging a system or a leader in abstract terms from a far off place. It's easy to do that. And it's even easier to then do nothing about it. I'd suggest we forget that stuff. Focus on those around us. And if we find injustices affecting their lives, we might also find some genuine motivation to take appropriate action. I think that's exactly what Martin Luther King did. And it's the only way we can resist bad authority in a constructive and loving way. Now, thankfully for myself and most people I know, we live in a relatively just society. We aren't significantly oppressed and our authorities have democratic checks in place to prevent them from really getting out of hand. We live in relative peace and freedom. It might not always feel easy, but we should be thankful for that. We should pray for our leaders and look for ways to support them rather than judging them. But beyond that, let our focus be on our community, our real relationships. Let our energy be invested in building those foundations rather than trying to tear down someone else's ivory tower. That's where I think Jesus is. And that's where we should be as well.